I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Seth Shostak, the Senior Astronomer for the SETI Institute. And today, we're talking about his organization's mission to explore, understand, and explain the origin, nature, and prevalence of life in the universe. Seth has a PhD in astronomy from Caltech and a BA in physics from Princeton University. He's been awarded the Carl Sagan Award for the Popularization of Science and the Klumpke Roberts Award for Astronomy Popularization. He hosts SETI's weekly radio show and podcast, Big Picture Science, and has played himself numerous times in television and internet film dramas, as well as acting in several science fiction films. Seth has co-authored a college textbook on astrobiology and has written three trade books on SETI. In addition, he's published more than 400 popular articles on science, including regular contributions to NBC News Mock, as well as giving dozens of talks annually, and he does regular outreach to students interested in science and astronomy. So, Seth, welcome, sir. Again, as I mentioned before the interview, it is such a tremendous honor to have you with me today. So, let me start out by thanking you for the decades of hard work that yourself and the SETI team have done. And I'd like to begin by asking, what was your personal inspiration to begin searching for intelligent life in the stars? Uh, well, Tim, I guess the answer to that is the cheesy sci-fi films that I saw as a kid, right? I mean, beginning at the age of nine or 10, you know, I would go to the movies on a fairly regular basis. And uh, the films that I liked best were the... Uh, the sci-fi films, they almost always involved aliens, not, not exclusively. There were monsters and things like that, too, that were domestic, if you will, from this planet. But the, the ones involving aliens, yeah, uh, it seemed like a good idea to go look for those aliens when I got older. Yeah. Well, now, so in terms of SETI, and again, I, I did a lot of research before the interview. I learned a lot of new stuff. And one, so one of the things, if I have this correctly, is SETI rents time, more or less, on radio telescopes to scan for signals coming from other civilizations in space. Now, so one of the challenges here is that the limitations of the size of the night sky, as well as coverage of telescopes, and then available time slots, those limit your your activities. Uh, I'm wondering, could you describe for me some of the challenges that your team faces when you're searching for signals? Well, uh, you've already pointed to perhaps the biggest challenge, and that is the universe is big. I mean, that's a good thing from many points of view. But on the other hand, if you're looking for something and you don't quite know where they are, right? In our case, you were looking for the aliens, and uh, we don't have any... Uh, uh, email from them saying, look, we're in the uh, uh, Proxima Centauri system, look for us there or whatever. We don't know where they are. So we have to look at either the entire sky, right? And then you say, okay, I, I don't know where they are. So I'll look everywhere. Or uh, we have to decide where we're going to point the antennas. We might look at nearby star systems or star systems known to have planets or whatever. So, you know, it's a bit like uh, saying, well, I lost my keys. I better go look for him. I mean, you could just, you know, search the entire planet or you could say, no, I, you know, I was only in the upstairs bedroom uh, when I lost them or something like that. So, uh, you know, th th that's a big technical challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, one of the other misconceptions, I think, is, um, you know, most people tend to look at SETI and they say SETI hasn't found anything yet, but they're still looking. Right. And in a sense, maybe that's true. But several candidate signals have been detected and there's tons of noise out there from various interstellar phenomena that we just don't have any kind of confirmation yet right so i i understand that every now and then signals are picked up where you guys tag those and say okay this needs more examination and then there's also just tons and tons of noise that gets recorded so what i'm wondering is do you think that ongoing advances in technology, right? Like artificial intelligence, as well as just computer processing speed and things along those lines. Do you think that we may already have signals recorded that, you know, may be deciphered, I guess, with better computing power? No, actually, I don't. Uh, to begin with, we don't record them. So, mm. so we don't even have such records. And the reason we don't record them, by the way, is simply because the, you know, the uh, influx of data the data stream 
that's coming into any of the telescopes we use. And as you point out, many of them are indeed uh, telescopes where time is being allocated to us, but on instruments that are used for other things. Or in the case of our own Allen telescope array, you know, that's our array, so we can use it 24 seven. But in any case, the data coming in, it's the proverbial fire hose, right? You yeah. can't possibly afford to store those data for, uh, you know, looking at it again or at another time. So data processing tends to be real time. In other words, it's being processed as it's coming in. Ah, okay, okay. And with now with those candidate signals I mentioned, and again, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I did see a graph and it looked like basically it'll it'll go along you see background noise and then i would see something that was circled or highlighted and they would say candidate signal you know x y or z and and so those could quite possibly already be some kind of an alien civilization we just weren't sure enough to confirm right well not exactly uh because indeed we get candidate signals i mean look you got this big antenna which means that it's very sensitive you're looking over millions of channels millions of uh you know, very narrow uh, channels, right? Because we don't know where on the dial the signal we're looking for might be. So we look at as many as we can, right? And so you've got this setup, which is really ready to go to find any sort of signals. And you find signals all the time. You find signals, you know, in the first uh, minute that you turn it on, because there are plenty of signals being generated by, in fact, terrestrial satellites, you know, satellites that are orbiting the earth that are sending down information about, you know, what the cloud cover looks like or whatever, right? So we pick all that stuff up too. And it has to be dealt with. We have to throw it away because that's not what we're interested in. And you can't record all the data and then, you know, look later at something. You just can't, you can't afford to store it. So everything is done real time. The data are coming in and at the same time, you're sifting out the candidate signals, signals that look like they could be the kind of thing you're looking for. And then, you know, quickly do tests within minutes and you've, you know, handled that part of the sky at that range of frequencies and you move on to the next. So it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's not a matter of storing tapes filled with data and looking at them later. You can't afford to do that. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Actually, when I think about it, just the amount of data. Yeah. That would be far too much to be able to store. Well, so the, another thing that I read about was something called the Morrison and Kikoni microwave window in the radio band spectrum. And as I understand things, this is kind of a preferential range where radio waves travel through space unimpeded. So I'm wondering, is this kind of a specific frequency range that you feel is the best for detecting communications or other techno signatures? And are you guys listening in, I'm sure you are listening in a much larger range than this also, right? Yeah, well, th this goes back to actually a paper that uh, Morrison and Cocconi, these are two physicists, uh, Philip Morrison and Giacconi, uh, his, his first name was an Italian one that I can't pronounce. But in any case, in 1959, they wrote a paper saying that, you know, gosh, maybe it makes sense to see if there's any, uh, there are any signals, you know, bouncing around the universe that we could pick up. And the question was, well, what frequency should we tune our receivers to? And they said, well, there's one frequency that all the uh, intelligent beings in the cosmos will know. And that's the frequency of uh, what's called a neutral hydrogen transition. It's a natural thing. And it's produced by hydrogen, hydrogen that floats between the stars. There is gas between the stars. It's not completely empty. You know, space is not exactly a, a vacuum. It's not. Okay. So, you know, maybe there's a, a couple of hydrogen atoms in every cubic centimeter of space, which is, you know, that's, that's pretty close to a vacuum, but not quite. And the, every now and again, those uh, hydrogen atoms do something, they flip over kind of thing, and then they produce a little bit of radio static. Anyhow, uh, that wouldn't amount to much of anything except for the fact that space is big, really big, to uh, quote somebody. So uh, so you do know that frequency because that's what you use to study space, right? But on the other hand, it's a frequency that will be marked on all the aliens' radio dials too. So if they're trying to get in touch, if they're making any effort to beam something out into the cosmos, Hey, we're the Klingons, and we'd really love to hear from you guys. I mean, if anybody's trying to do that, they will broadcast presumably on that frequency, uh, no matter what else they're doing, simply because they know 
everybody else in the cosmos is going to have a setup that can pick up at that frequency, can pick that frequency up. That was recognized by Kokoni and Morrison, but it was also recognized by Frank Drake, who did the first SETI experiment uh, less than a year after Kokoni and Morrison had published their paper. And the two groups didn't know about one another, and they came to the same conclusion. So that suggests it's maybe not a bad conclusion. Yeah, well, and actually, Frank Drake was my next question because it, you know, and this is something. He's the father of the Drake equation, and this is something I've discussed on on my podcast many times. He also worked for SETI. He did pioneering work in this field decades earlier with something called Project Ozma. Now, I'm wondering when Frank was working with you, did he ever do any estimates on how many signals SETI was likely to detect, likely to detect in a given period of time? Well, Frank Drake was, in fact, the president of the SETI Institute when I joined. Uh, so, and, and he he continued to work here, well, well through retirement and up till a couple of years ago, uh, actually. And he just died at age ninety-two, yeah. I believe. Uh, but you know, when he was ninety, he was still coming into the office. So, uh, it was great to work with Frank. Yeah, uh, he what he did do is formulate an equation known as the Drake equation, where he tried to estimate, well, how many societies are out there in the Milky Way galaxy right now who are broadcasting signals that we could conceivably pick up, right? Because if the answer is a really small number, like one or two, then you don't have much chance. If the number is bigger, Carl Sagan thought it might be millions, right? If there are a million other societies broadcasting in the Milky Way galaxy, then your chances of picking up one might not be so bad, right? So he wrote this equation. And the, of course, the question is, well, what's the number that the equation predicts? And the answer to that is there's no answer to that because we don't know many of the terms in the equation. But Frank Drake himself figured there were maybe 10,000 societies in our galaxy. Frank was a smart guy. And, uh, you know, I, I, I listened to what he said. And 10,000 might be the reasonable number. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so in terms of intentionality, right, in terms of other societies, other civilizations reaching out the same way that we are, you know, it, it, it sounds like there's kind of a, a band and frequencies that have been kind of identified. Now, in terms of techno signatures, those are probably less focused, you know, but they might also be they might also be more prevalent. Right. I mean, there may be many civilizations out there that maybe they're not broadcasting intentionally, but they're like us. Right. Where they have radio going all over the place. Um, one of the things I was wondering there is, you know, it, it, do you think that as civilizations become more advanced, they may become harder to detect? And I, I ask that because of things like tight beam laser and, you know, just high frequency things, things that may not travel over distance as well. And, you know, things where energy is more focused, I guess. I'm not probably expressing that very well, but. Well, well, there, this this is been an argument in the past decade or so uh, from people who say, look, you know, consider what we're doing, right? Homo sapiens. We have a lot of powerful transmitters uh, like television, for example, and FM radio. Those signals do go out into space, not because the advertisers insist on it. They don't get much business, I suggest, from the, uh, from the aliens, but those signals naturally just go, you know, over the rooftops and then out into space. However, you know, things are changing, technology is changing. And, you know, most people don't get their television by having a big antenna on the roof anymore. They, they're taking it over cable. So there's no big transmitter necessary. And this is sort of a general phenomenon. We're moving toward other technologies for, you know, uh, conveying information around. And that may mean that we're going radio quiet. And so the aliens you're looking for, they're probably all radio quiet already. Well, um, I don't buy it, something that Howard Hughes would never say. Uh, I don't buy it because I think that there are other uses for radio, many of which we don't even know yet, that the aliens could be doing. But one thing we do know is, for example, radar. We have a lot of radar, mm. right? And it's, yeah. it's not it's not going away. You still have your radar down at the local airport. <laughs> you have radar, you know, the dew line looking for incoming missiles. Maybe that'll go away. But the radars at the airport are radars used to to look for long period comets that otherwise could ruin your whole day. Those are things that any society will have and will keep. And so I think that to say, oh, well, the aliens are there, but their planet is radio quiet because they've got all this fiber optic technology or something like that. I, I think that that's a little bit uh, anthropocentric. I think it's maybe not right. If it is right, we're not going to find anything. If it's not right, we could find something. 
Yeah. Well, and, and again, this goes to this whole idea of techno signatures, you know, and these technologies get utilized in so many different ways. And that's that's part of the, you know, part of the thought process, I guess, that you guys have put into it is what are some of the different types of utilizations for the radio band that we could look for? Yeah. Most techno signatures are, you know, it's just the definition of the word, but aren't radio or anything like that. When they say techno signatures, usually what people mean is, look, the universe is, what, 13 and a half billion years old, right? I remember when the news of the Big Bang made it on the nightly news. Okay, so, you know, 13 and a half billion years old. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. So, you know, we've only been around for the last one third of the existence of the universe. That means that the majority of the stars you see out there are really older than the sun, right? Well, I mean... That's not quite true, but for reasons that have nothing to do with this discussion, so we don't need to go into it. But the facts are that most of the universe is considerably older than uh, than our part, right? Our own solar system. So there could be societies out there that could easily be millions, even billions, with a B, even billions of years older than our societies. So, you know, maybe they built stuff. Right. Maybe they built giant what are called Dyson spheres or big constructions, you know, for whatever reason that we could just see. Right. With ordinary telescopes. And so that would be a techno signature, something mm, okay. that the aliens have done, you know, that betrays their presence. It's like, uh, you know, asking, uh, I don't know, the, the Narragansett Indians. Uh, back in the uh, 1700s, hey, do you think you're being visited by Spaniards? Look, they got the, they, they got this giant uh, chapel, uh, church of being constructed down the road here and so forth. You know, they've they've done something that's very obvious even to a naive viewer. So maybe that kind of a techno signature is something that we may find. Ah, uh, okay. Well, it, it, this is all for me. This is all driving towards my question about the Fermi paradox and then potentially the Great Filter as well, right? And these are I'm sure that you've gone over these many, many times, but the Fermi paradox is we're looking, we haven't seen anything yet. And if the Drake equation is right, we could potentially be seeing hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of signals coming in from all over the place. But to, to the best of what we can tell, we're not yet. And so, you know, do you have any ideas on on what what this paradox might be the result of? Yeah, well, the Fermi paradox, just for those who don't know what it is, uh, it's called that because Enrico Fermi, the Italian-American physicist, uh, sort of got the ball rolling on this idea in uh, apparently 1950. This is, you know, it's, it's somewhat apocryphal, but it seems to be true. He was having lunch at uh, Los Alamos with a couple of other physicists, and he said, so where is everybody? And what he meant by that was that, look, the universe has been around a long time. We just talked about that. And there should be societies all over the place by now. And, you know, the, the neighborhood doesn't seem to have any, right? We don't see anybody. And so that's what's known as the Fermi paradox. The universe is old enough and capable of producing lots of societies, and we don't see them. We haven't seen them. But on the other hand, you know, I, I think that while that's an intriguing idea, the premise that we don't see anybody is probably wrong. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't know, taking a ship to Africa and exploring, you know, the first couple of uh, acres of ground that you come to and say, yeah, I don't see any elephants here. Uh, you know, and there should be elephants. I don't see them. Well, you don't see them because you haven't looked hard enough and long enough. And I, you know, uh, obviously this sounds like it's uh, self-serving, but in fact, I think that's the explanation for the Fermi paradox. The Fermi paradox makes a big conclusion, namely there are no aliens, based on a very local observation. We don't see any, right? And uh, I think that, uh, you know, it's not a very strong argument against the existence of aliens. Yeah, well, and that's good because it, it goes to this idea of the great filter, which is maybe there's some event that destroys civilizations, you know, and then there's the speculation about, OK, you know, is that something like global climate change? And are we ahead of that? Have we overcome that? Or is that still ahead of us, you know, waiting to destroy us in the future? So, you know, this this great filter idea causes anxiety, and it seems like that's tied to the Fermi paradox. And from what you're saying, it's it's just we we're just not there yet we just haven't looked I, at it I, I think so the the great filter idea is you know it's it's based on the premise look we don't find any aliens so something must be wiping out the aliens right just as they get to the point where we could hear them because otherwise we would hear them 
if they self-destruct after being on the air for uh, 10,000 or 100,000 years, well, we would still find some of them. Well, they might be gone now, but you know, but the fact that we don't find anybody must mean that no, none of them get to the point where they build a transmitter so that we could find them with our SETI experiments. And so the implication is, you know, we're all doomed because there's something they maybe we don't see, but there's something that's going to wipe us out. And maybe climate change or, a, you know, a pandemic of some sort or nuclear war or what. I mean, everybody has their favorite doomsday scenario. Well, again, I don't buy this. I mean, sure, some societies may wipe themselves out, but it's really hard for even for humanity to wipe itself out. I mean, you might think, well, oh, uh, is it that hard? Consider, you might want to try some of these things this coming weekend, right? Let's wipe everybody out with a pandemic. Well, we have a pandemic now, and not even, not everybody even gets the disease involved, right? There's always uh, going to be some people whose DNA makes them naturally immune to any particularly, or sorry, any particular uh, uh, disease. And the pandemic is going to wipe out, yes, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people. But given that there are 8 billion people, the effect on the total population is very, very tiny. Okay. All right. Well, what about climate change? Hey, climate change is not a good thing. I don't recommend it, but it's not going to wipe out humanity, right? There's just no way it can do that, right? And even the nuclear, I made it back of the envelope calculation. Let's let all the nukes fly just, as, just for the fun of it. We'll just let all 14,000 or whatever the number is of these uh, nuclear weapons. Let's just have them drop on all the, the cities of the, of the planet, or at least 14,000 of them. How many people do you get rid of? A lot of people. But you don't get rid of even half of the number of people on Earth. So this great filter theory, I think, I, when I think great filter now, I think of uh, coffee, because mm. I, I, I don't think we can wipe ourselves out. And I doubt that the aliens can completely wipe themselves out either. Well, no, that's a good point, right? I mean, life on Earth has been evolving for hundreds of millions of years with this singular goal of survival reproduction. And so, you know, it's it's built into us on a level that's below even our humanity is survive and reproduce. And it's not that easy to just turn that off, I guess. Well, um, I mean, th th that's true. That isn't to say you couldn't, you know, kill everybody in principle. Maybe you could, but it's, it's, it's just very hard to do. Very yeah. hard to do. Look, life has been on this planet for almost 4 billion years, you know, biology. DNA, okay? And not once in that 4 billion years, despite all sorts of catastrophes, including, you know, asteroid impacts or snowball earth where, you know, the entire planet was covered with ice and that sort of thing. These are all things that have happened in history. Lots of, you know, uh, ice ages. Never got rid of all the life, never. You know, the dinosaurs bought it, that's true. But, you know, most life survived. It's, it's hard to get rid of everybody. Yeah. Well, Seth, I'd like to ask about the Carl Sagan ad adaptation of uh, of Contact, the movie Contact, right? It, the, the adaptation of his book. Um, this, for me, this was one of my absolute favorite representations of SETI. And I, I love the big picture ideas, especially in the end of it. I, I know that there was a lot of, uh, what would you call it, artistic interpretation there. But um you know, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on contact? How well does that represent the work that you're doing? Well, uh, I, I was an advisor, actually, for the film, as several others of us here at the Institute were. And so we knew what was going on. And after all, the screenplay was, you know, based on Carl Sagan's 1983, I think it was, book, Contact. So from a science perspective, it's much more accurate than most films depicting uh, alien encounters, right? I mean, I mean, at least the aliens in this film didn't, you know, come all the way to Earth just to flatten Los Angeles. Not that I, you know, I'm in Northern California, and personally, if they flatten Los Angeles, it's okay by me. But, you know, it was certainly more correct, scientifically correct. But on the other hand, you know, I, I do some advising for uh, theaters, sorry, not theaters, theatrical productions right, for movies. And, uh, you know, I'll try and correct the science and the script and stuff like that. But really, to be honest, and it's fun to do, but it, it's kind of useless in the sense that it doesn't matter. People don't go to the movies to learn science. And when they come out of the movies, they probably haven't learned any science, right? The question in the movie is, well, what's compelling about the storyline or the characters? Those are the things that count. So contact has to be seen as a movie. It was a movie. Uh, and uh, as I say, 
it was from the science perspective better than most there were still some howlers in there that uh, carl sagan would have corrected except for the fact that he died uh shortly into the production schedule of the film but uh, in any case yeah i think it's a great film <laughs> but it's but it's you know it's not physics 101 <laughs> oh yeah yeah well you know one of the things that i i think for me was most compelling was they expressed loneliness as being the premise for et reaching out to us you know that desire to share and learn and communicate and uh, you know and, and just i guess add light to a, a, a dark empty sky right and and for me that was that was what resonated the most actually i think it was that humanistic element of it you know and so um so I, I did want to ask, though, as you mentioned, contact is more correct or, or more on par for SETI than a lot of other stuff out there. Um, are, are there any issues that come up with pop culture and movies in general? I mean, we've got UFOs zipping around. You know, we have depictions of science. I mean, Buck Rogers stuff that's way off there. And, you know, and then we have things like... Uh, like a couple that come to mind for me are um, Star Trek, which is kind of a space Western, and then Star Wars, which is space fantasy. All of these things put these ideas out there about space and the universe that have really very little to do with real life. Is that something that makes your work more difficult? Well, I don't think so, actually. In fact, I look at it as a positive thing. Yes, there's a whole UFO phenomenon. One third of the American populace thinks that Earth is being visited by aliens. Uh, I don't, but if they if they think that, fine, right? Let them evaluate the evidence. <laughs> I, uh, I'm writing a, another article for a newspaper about that actually right now as, as we speak. Well, maybe not as we speak, but I, I, as we finish speaking, I'll write the rest of it. Uh, and and in, in a sense, you could say that's a good thing because at least they're interested in the whole topic of whether aliens exist and how we might uh, encounter them. Uh, so, you know, in fact, when we look at the number of people that visit the SETI Institute's website, you know, that's just a very sort of smooth curve. In other words, it doesn't vary much from year to year. And over the course of years, it may change, but, it, you know, it, it's not subject to rapid fluctuations. And the only exception to that was when the X-Files was on TV, when the number mm. of people coming to our website actually went up. Uh, markedly. So, uh, yeah, good thing. I think S S Mulder and Scully were probably uh, not g accurate portrayals of the science, but that's okay. Movies are, and television shows are not about science. They're about emotion. They're about stories. Now, back then, and this isn't on my questions list, but I remember back in the 90s, there was a, a tool called SETI at home. Is that is that still around? That was you mentioned real time processing of all this data. As I recall, SETI at home was something. I had this on my PC where you could download it and it would basically pull down batches of data, process them, look for signals, and then put that back into some kind of an aggregator to basically spread this computer load out. Are are, are you guys doing anything like that contemporarily? Well, yeah, that was the idea of a fellow up in the Seattle area, believe it or not, and. Uh, a, a buddy of mine who's at the University of Washington there uh, heard about it from this this fellow, and he called me up and he said, hey, look, here's an idea. We can use people's personal computers to process SETI data, which I thought was an interesting idea indeed. But for various technical reasons, we couldn't do that. But the University of California at Berkeley, which is you know just across the bay here, 50 miles away from where I'm sitting, uh, they they did embrace this because they didn't require real time data analysis. Mm. That's the problem with SETI at home, right? You download a chunk of data and you process it on your computer while you're having a tuna fish sandwich in the in the kitchen. But it's not as the data has been taken. If you find a signal and keep in mind, everybody finds signals because signals are very commonplace. If you find a signal, you know, it's it's too late. The people that are using the telescope have, you know, moved on to the next. Yeah. So for us, it wasn't actually uh, something that we could use. But the University of California Berkeley SETI group did use SETI at home. And some, something like 7 million people eventually downloaded that software. They stopped SETI at home about two years ago now, uh, oh, stopped supporting okay. it. And the reason is not that it wasn't a, an interesting thing to do. It was still a minority of the data that was being processed that way. But still, you know, it was it was a, a good tool but it required manpower. It required one person whose job it was to, 
you know, manage the SETI at home, uh, deal with people's technical problems or whatever. And SETI is so poorly funded that one more person is an expense they could not uh, any longer afford. So SETI at home has sort of gone away, which is too bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, again, it just highlights, I think, the, the role that technology plays in this. And, you know, hopefully as technology progresses, as data processing and all of those things progress, that will only help your mission more. So, Seth, let me thank you so much for your time again today. And again, let me express, it is truly an honor to have <laughs> you with me. So um, let me close by asking, what comes next for yourself and SETI? Where will you see yourself in future headlines in, until Intelligent Life is detected? Because that will make all of the headlines. Well, it will make the headlines. Yeah. I, you know, what's next for SETI? There are all sorts of initiatives in SETI these days. There are always all are, but there are some now. Uh, there's a project to use the very large array. That's a, an array of 27 antennas down in the New Mexico desert to use that for SETI, even while it's being used for astronomical research. So it's sort of a piggyback set up there. That to me is a very interesting project because you're going to be looking at a lot of the sky. Yeah, you don't get to choose where you're looking, but then again, we don't know where the aliens are anyhow. So that might not matter too much. Uh, there, of course, are continued developments at the Allen Telescope Array, which is our, our array. Uh, better receivers, which means you can see weaker signals, always mm. a good thing. Also, more of the radio dial at once that you can process. These are all technical things, right? Uh, in terms of, if you will, the science things, uh, the most interesting topics are, are what we're learning about planets around other stars called exoplanets. And uh, that research is really a hot topic in astronomy. So we're learning a lot there. And I, you know, I think all of that is going to uh, be useful for SETI in that it provides an, uh, a fundamental foundation, as most foundations are, uh, a, a foundation for what we're doing that says, look, what's happened on Earth is, yeah, it's interesting, but it's not a miracle. It's not something that hasn't happened in many other places. We assume that. And, uh, you know, research is trying to test that theory. Absolutely. Seth, thank you again so much for your time today. Thank you, Tim.